Welcome to the second breakout session of the day. The title is How Can AI Support Fair Mobility and Help Mobile Citizens and Relevant Institutions? The focus of the session is as follows. We will look at concrete cases that show how AI and data mining can be used to support citizens and institutions. These technologies are already used by certain institutions to detect undeclared work and cases of fraud in the granting of societal security benefits, social security benefits. Member states have shown an increased interest in AI and we can expect this to rise even more. For instance, chatbots help increase the availability of advice services, exchange of information and sharing of good practices is key to reach the full potential of this technology. At the same time, the bilateral and multilateral exchange of information and the interconnection of databases in a cross-border context is already a reality in some countries. And this, of course, links with AI. The solution introduced by Finland and Estonia to automate the data exchange between their national population registers is an example of that that you may be familiar with. If you're joining us today for the first time, my name is Ali Al Jabri. I'm a professional moderator. It's a great pleasure to be with you. The format of the session is as follows. We'll have three excellent speakers. They will each do a presentation of about 10 minutes. After each presentation, I'll check if there's an informative question of clarification that you have that doesn't require an elaborate answer. Perhaps, you know, ask what does that abbreviation mean? Something like that. Then we will have, after the three presentations, we'll have a Q&A session between us. If you wish, you can speak from the room, raise your hand and a microphone will be there. But you can also join us on Slido. The Slido code should be visible. Excellent. And you may send in your questions at any moment and they'll be passed on to me. You can also vote for a question that you like. It'll appear in your device. How about we start with an applause for this session? We'll start with a presentation of Mr. Bart Stalpart. He's Director General of SIUD, the Social Information Investigation Service here in Belgium. A renowned expert in his field. We're very happy he has made the time to join us. Please welcome him as he approaches the stage for his presentation. Thank you, Ali. Um, thank you for having me here. Hopefully I will be brief because we have 10 minutes. It's very important to be brief as usual. So, first slide, short survey. Who knows Star Trek? Raise your hand. Okay, that's not bad, because there are a lot of young people and perhaps it's not known anymore. But those who know it, Star Trek, they know the phrase, Scotty, beam me up. And then they, you see them leaving and entering somewhere else. Imagine that this could be a help for us on tackling social fraud. Is artificial intelligence a tool like Star Trek the Scotty beam me up. That's my intention to explain you a little bit. So, I will not be, I will not be uh, Captain Kirk or Stock. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. So, in Belgium, we have um, a so-called reference framework because we have a strategic action plan. And in this strategic action plan, you have seven strategic objectives. Why is this important? Because one of the uh, most important things, if you want to have artificial intelligence or data mining or whatever, you have to have political support and administrative support. And what we see in Belgium, this strategic framework already installed a very important one on this. It's the seventh one, the sixth one, simplify and improve administration, which includes also digitalization. And there in this chapter already is mentioned artificial intelligence and data mining risk analysis. So strategic plan from our institution together with the government, first element. Secondly, we are al always working on what we call the enforcement chain, prevention, detection, controls, inspections and recovery. And each 
of these phases, you can use data mining, risk analysis, and of course also artificial intelligence. I will come back to this uh, afterwards. We have six fraud phenomena, and uh, the most important in Belgium is social dumping. It's cross-border uh, abuses of people and also not being contributors, the salaries and so on. I will not go into depth with because it's too technically otherwise. Okay, next one. Tools data mining, what do we mean with, with this uh, data mining? Um, yes, it's try to use specific uh, characteristics um, by, um, by searching them by using algorithms. Uh, this is important, so they are the techniques uh, done by scientific persons, so that means another challenge, if you want to introduce this in your country, you have to have technicians. Uh, scientific approach means you have to have uh, intelligent people, knowledge. Secondly, you also have to have another challenge, also the business involved to uh, make this happening. And what are we trying to do with our uh, artificial uh, intelligence or the data mining tool is that we try to detect what are the specific characteristics and uh, we, 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 we looked in those uh, employers who already have a lot of infringements and we compare them with those who don't have infringements and then you can make, by using those algorithms, you can say, okay, we can predict perhaps where are they are going to pop up. The Scotty beam me up. Imagine that we have this, we have this installed on the data mining tool and now we are using artificial intelligence in the future for also be more effective. So you identify the characteristics and then you uh, try to organize yourself, your inspectorates, to, to go um, on site. So the predictive element uh, is working. Uh, in Belgium, we have seen this. The added value of this is, Im is impressive because we have limited resources. Everybody has limited resources, so we have to use them very carefully and select wisely your targets. So this can help. Next slide, please. If we go more in a little bit in detail, we use this in tackling, as I mentioned, in social dumping. Uh, um, and we installed this already in uh, 2014. Uh, we have a specific action plan on tackling social fraud on declared work. In 2014, we had introduced this and we have seen the results. We have, you can see them on the slides. You see that in more than 40%, we have a hit rate on, on real social dumping cases. If we compare them with the possible uh, indication of uh, social dumping, that we see that more than 70%, in 70% of our model, or, you know, of our model, our scenarios, um, there's a prediction there's going to be um, social fraud or social dumping on construction sites. So this is quite a lot. So we introduced not only the techniques, but also, of course, the process. Um, it's good that you have artificial intelligence, but we have to do something with this. Right? The data mining, the risk analysis, so that means we are conducting on the field inspections that are um, so that to test our scenarios and to see if the results match with the predictive element. And we see there's a high uh, rate. Okay, next slide because limited time. How can artificial intelligence help? Yes, I think. It's relatively easy eh, to answer questions for the business, so not the scientific, scientific, but more the business people, so the inspectors on the field, to support them with their help and eh, with their uh, with the with these tools. Also, um, to in introduce a data-driven approach in your organization. So we introduced our scenario social dumping in 2014. In the beginning, it was very difficult because the inspector said, "Yeah, but, oh, sorry, we know it better." Eh? Sorry, but I am on the field. Um, those in Brussels, I'm, of course, working in Brussels, they, they think they do know it better. But now we have installed a culture that, we, that the, they see also the added value of this data-driven uh, approach. And on, the, on the base, you see what is really the challenge, though the biggest challenge, is to orientate your limited uh, resources because our means are not that huge. So you have to, uh, have to bear this in mind. And this is a great tool that can help our inspectors to uh, detect and to prevent uh, social fraud. So um, next slide, please. 
We are mostly using them on detection side. Uh, we are we are have targeted lists uh, the, to to inspect on the field different construction sites. We have a lot of phenomena and, and scenarios. I will not go into it in detail, but more in the de detection and uh, in the inspection uh, elements uh, in phase. But there should also be more uh, an approach to other phases in the enforcement chain. Why not use this um, to prevent more the social fraud? If we think on guidelines who exp that explains the um, legislation on employers, but also if you want to uh, explain the rights of the employees who come to Belgium, I think it's quite clear if you're using artificial intelligence chatbot to make in a relatively easy way to explain what are the rights to the employees and what are the rights or the, um, the, the, the rules that they have to respect on the employer side, you think this is pretty clear that in a raise awareness campaign together with Europe and the Commission, ELA and whatever, you can really have an impact on preventing uh, social fraud and to avoid that we have to inspect afterwards uh, perhaps uh, what is uh, what is going on of course also you can see the loopholes in legislation by using your data mining techniques and uh, artificial intelligence so next slide please yes you, you can move on because it's a slide with uh, pop-up uh, elements yes thank you this is more easier so Potential use case, if we see it in the beginning on the prevention side, we can use it on nudging. Nudging, you know all, way, uh, you know all what this means. That means we are using communication campaigns to, uh, uh, um, to change your behavior. Um, behavior of people, behavior of employees, uh, employers. So this artificial intelligence could be used in nudging techniques. Uh, why not? Uh, we already have installed in Belgium nudging. So now, yes, two minutes, now we can use artificial intelligence to assemble the different um, elements of legislation into this um, uh, element. In the selection side, of course, that's quite clear. If you are using uh, these techniques, that the infringement rate could be much higher than uh, what you expect as an individual inspectorate or an individu individual inspector on the field. You put the knowledge together of data scientists and, of course, also the business, and then you get, due to uh, artificial intelligence, more techniques. Natural languages processing. If you are uh, using um, the reports of the inspectors and you are using techniques um, by artificial intelligence that can see what elements are common in the different reports, then you can use this in a, a more um, structured way that also the rate of infringements in the future could, or loopholes in the legislation could be more and better be detected. And why not introduce also um, computer vision and smart cameras um, by, for searching uh, infringements, why not um, the drones and so on and so on. Of course, you're all going to say yes, but privacy, of course, you have to always be, bear in mind. What are the challenges? Next slide, please. We have a lot of data in Belgium. Uh, these are all databases. If you put them together or link them together, yeah, of course, your data must be, have high quality. And also, it should be accessible, uh, but regarding the rules of data, of, uh, data mining and uh, privacy law, of course. But this is very important. The data quality is necessary. Otherwise, even if you have artificial intelligence or data mining, but the quality of your data is not good, then your results will not be good either. So it's perhaps not due to the data mining techniques that are failing. No, it's perhaps because your data is not good. So the quality is very important, also the accessibility. I will not go into detail because I don't have the time anymore. But this is very, very, very important. In Belgium, we have a long tradition in this, building this up. So if you want to build Rome, and uh, afterwards there's an Italian colleague from me, um, Rome is beautiful, but it takes time to build it uh, like the way it is. Uh, so, if member states want to try to do this, you should take time. Time, negotiations, also involve the social partners and use what is, um, what is relevant and, um, and the, the political decisions you have to 
prove that they are effective and the return on investment is great. Next slide, please. Yes, very important rule. We introduced this already in 2014. Very important. It's only the inspectorates on the field who are taking the decisions, not the machines. So, no computer, no kit, whatever. Uh, uh, no, we. It's only an indication there's a possible fraud. The risk analysis uh, shows that there's a uh, potential fraud phenomenon on the field. But it's always the inspector who's taking the decisions. So, I will not go into detail because everybody knows the Holland case. I will not go into Belgium, Holland. Uh, this has nothing to do with this. Uh, of course, we are better in football than them, but this is not that, that uh, important. So it, this means uh, um, Holland has his specific case. We learned about this too, uh, and we said now it should be uh, decision-making by us. Next slide, please. We are not standing still. That means you have to think, okay, the artificial intelligence is there. So we have to bear in mind as an administration, it's there, we're going to use it. So the private sector is using it, why not the public services? Uh, if we can use our guidelines and to transform them in uh, interactive ways that employers can know their rights, employers know the, uh, know the rules of the legislation, I think this could be great. Also, uh, imagine that we combine um, uh, data from our um, unemployment services together with uh, uh, vacancies, why not? We should do this, this is important. But then again, you have to have rules, and we built in Belgium a charter for the responsible use of artificial intelligence. And I think this is something useful that on, perhaps on the commission side also should be uh, done, and I know they already have started the discussion and legislation and so on. I think this is important because you have to have rules and the people should know their right when we are using this as a public um, institution in this regard. So thank you. Hopefully I was not too, and not too long and normally I should now Scotty beam me up and it would be there, but I will walk now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. But first things first, coming from the Netherlands, I'll take you on that challenge. <laughs> so, the Netherlands has defeated Belgium 50, 55 times. <laughs> Belgium has defeated the Netherlands 41 times. And it was a draw 29 times. I can't help it, it's the data. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart. We'd like you to join us on Slido to get to know each other just a little better now that uh, Bart has kicked off everything substance-wise. Um, let's have the first Slido poll question, please, if you could make that work. Excellent. Join us on Slido. The QR code is on the screen. What is your background? We'd like to know a little more about you. Are you a researcher? You're none of the above. All right. <laughs> Are you a public employment service person, public administration, and expert in social security? Don't worry, we cannot trace the data back to your individual person. This is just collective data. 13 people, maybe we get to 20. It's to be expected, yeah? Public administration is such a broad definition. That's the majority, none of the above. Expert in social security. No one works for a public employment service. That, that's interesting. Brilliant. Let's have the next question. Thank you, so, thank you very much so far. Here's the next poll question. What will be the effect of AI on a scale from one to four? and what we mean the effect of AI on social security systems. So the effect of AI on a scale from one to four on social security systems.
Let's wait a bit more for the sample to be representative. So positive, 68, very positive, 4, neutral, 19%, and bad, 18%. No, hold on, 8%. Excellent. Thank you for your participation so far. We'll return to these results. Let's now have our second speaker. Our second speaker works at the National Institute of Social Security in Italy, also called INPS. She's a senior administrator. Please welcome Serena De Paolo. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for inviting me at this unique event. I'm really happy to be here. And I will try to illustrate you how our institution deals with uh, social security frauds through IT and AI-based systems. But um, before I do that, I just would like, next slide please, uh, to very quickly introduce IMSS because I don't know if anybody knows this institution. Uh, IMSS is the National uh, Social Security Institute in Italy, uh, dealing with uh, 42 million of uh, people and 1.8 million employers. Uh, IMSS provides more than uh, 300 different kinds of benefits, like pensions, unemployment benefits, uh, family benefits, and so on, uh, for a total amount of around uh, 350 billion euros per year. Uh, so it's quite uh, easy to understand that with these uh, huge numbers, we really uh, had the opportunity, uh, a great opportunity uh, with the digitalization process because uh, it's uh, quite uh, easier to deal with these numbers uh, thanks to IT systems. Um, before I talk about the focus of my work, that is frauds committed by employers, I just would like to show how digitalization uh, also helped IMSS to improve its services for citizens. Next slide, please. Um, I'll be very fast. I just um, say two words about the Digital Pension Consultant, that is a um, service released in uh, 2022 that we developed thanks to uh, next generation EU funds, and it's uh, an AI-based AI system. Um, it's a, a sort of personalized system accessible through IMSS uh, website and uh, dedicated mobile app, where pensioners can get uh, advice and help about their questions, and um, they also can especially uh, check if they are entitled to uh, supplementary benefits. Uh, I think it's uh, quite important to underline that uh, this service has been accessed in the first year of activity uh, by 1.5 million people. And uh, thanks to this ser service, um, the requests for supplementary benefits have increased by 136% in one year. So um, it, it shows how AI can really give a boost to services and to uh, really serve citizens uh, better. Um, next slide, please. But as I told you, I work at the anti-fraud department, so my work focuses um, on uh, frauds committed by employers. Um, we have three main goals at the anti-fraud department. Uh, the first one is increasing the payment of social contributions, which is, of course, essential for the functioning of the social security system, uh, reducing the payment of undue benefits, and in general, assuring that um, the social legislation uh, is respected and there is respect for social rights. Um, Next slide, please. 
So, uh, talking about fraud committed by employers, um, I would like to um, just very quickly uh, talk about the fact that we started, uh, of course, at the beginning with uh, traditional um, human-based controls on-site inspections. And now, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, there are many checks that can be performed directly from the computers of the operators, so remote inspections that are, of course, um, cheaper and faster, so very efficient in some ways. Um, and um, one of the benefits to can conduct remote inspections is that uh, we uh, can sometimes bring forward the moment of the controls, so uh, we can uh, have a fraud prevention strategy. We can uh, stop the fraud before uh, the financial effects are, uh, have taken place. And this is very important, uh, especially in the case of undue benefits, for example, because it's quite easier to stop the fraud before paying an undue benefit than arriving when the uh, benefit has been paid and you have to recover money. Um, concerning this, I, I would like to illustrate one of the first AI-based systems that uh, IMSS developed that we call uh, the frozen system. And next, okay, it's there. Uh, this system is um, aimed at preventing uh, the fraudulent behavior of fake employers, uh, of fake employers that um, transmit fake declarations, uh, according to which fake workers uh, could get unemployment benefits. Um, the, f the system analyzes every month uh, 1.8 million forms transmitted by the employers, and it detects uh, more or less one. 1,500 uh, forms that are, are um, uh, high-risk forms. And um, what, what's the, what happens? Uh, th these forms are, we, we say they are frozen, they are blocked, so uh, the unemployment benefits are not going to be paid, but the operators are notified, they have to analyze the situation, the specific situation, and they have to assess if the workers that are referred to in those forms are real workers, so they really have the right to get the benefits, uh, the unemployment benefits, or uh, in the case of fake workers, they confirm the freezing and uh, the undue benefits are not paid. This means that, as I was saying before, uh, that there is no further need for uh, activities to recover money because the undue benefits are stopped before being paid. Uh, in the first five years of activity, the frozen system helped detecting uh, more or less 70,000 fake work contracts and saving half a billion uh, of undue benefits. So it's uh, quite a, an effective measure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the framework of the uh, anti-fraud activities, uh, we, um, the IMSA, had the opportunity to develop a new business intelligence system thanks to a national program which is funded by the European Social Fund and the European Regional Development Fund. And uh, it's a um, very advanced system uh, which is still developing, uh, based on big data technology and on some AI tools. Uh, it works on a um, data lake infrastructure that, um, where there are a million of data collected from different sources, both internal and external to our organization. And uh, thanks to this data availability, uh, we are able to conduct data mining, uh, data analysis, and also uh, we uh, expect to be able to uh, predict frauds in a few months, maybe by the end of the next year. Uh, 
in the framework of these uh, new business intelligence system, we conduct fraud analysis. For example, the employer's compliant dashboard is uh, a fraud analysis system where uh, our operators can select uh, the, um, uh, the employers they want to investigate uh, according to different features. They can analyze and combine different data and have a quick impression about uh, the, the, the employer's um, behavior, if it's compliant with social legislation or not. So they can decide if they want to investigate more or if they just have to analyze other companies. Uh, the same data set concerning this 1.8 million uh, employers registered at Teams is the basis for uh, the tool we are developing to, for fraud prediction. Next slide, please. That uh, we call the employer's compliance score. Uh, this data set uh, is the basis to, uh, for, for the training of a machine learning model, which is uh, analyzing a sample of selected businesses to uh, identify fraud patterns. And then uh, we expect by the end of next year that the system will be able to assign a compliance score to each one of the 1.8 million employers registered at IMSS. So uh, this will let us know uh, in one number if the employer is compliant with social legislation or not. Even for newborn uh, companies, companies that has, are just registered and uh, don't have a story with IMSS. So uh, we, we can say it's a, a kind of fraud prediction. Uh, this, we expect that this system will, will let us, uh, will allow, the, allow us to predict many kinds of frauds like undeclared work or um, violation of collective agreements and so on. So um, even maybe frauds that we don't know now because uh, the system should be uh, intelligent. And in this way, uh, we hope we will be able to orient the controls on uh, the low compliance employers. So it's quite clear that it's um, a system that uh, will allow us to have a better organizational work and have uh, benefits in terms of financial savings. And um, in general, we can say that AI uh, will, will give uh, IMPS a real uh, boost for its services and activities to make all services and activities more and more efficient and effective. And uh, what I want to underline is that anyway, and it's quite clear, I think, I hope, uh, with what I said, uh, the human intervention uh, will be always guaranteed and will be essential. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> Should I go? Serena, thank you very much. Our last but not l uh, least speaker is researcher at IAB, the Institute of Employment Research, which is part of the German Federal Employment Agency. And she's also researching at the University of Oldenburg and has experienced research in the German Public Employment Service. Oh, I actually just said that. Um, and her name is Marijke Sirman Winkler. Please give her an applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will present you some more AI use cases in social services, as well as uh, risks that can be associated with AI in this sensitive field of application. And one way to mitigate or even prevent th those risks is to align AI systems um, to the user's needs. So I will also touch upon the role of acceptance of AI in social services 
and also will particularly um, show what this means for the design and implementation of AI. Next, sli next slide, please. So we have various AI systems already in use in social services uh, in Europe and abroad. And from my perspective, these AI tools are um, mainly implemented in the, yeah, in the back end um, of social services. That means in the internal processes, in, in the public authorities, for example, uh, to verify unemployment numbers, which is a very um, big calculation, um, people told me. Plus, um, AI is also implemented in the statutory accident insurance to um, predict which cases have a high probability for a successful recourse process. That means uh, um, taking a liable third person in recourse if there is a um, accident on the way to work or at work. But we are seeing also that AI is now increasingly being implemented in the front end of uh, public services where administration and citizens meet more directly. For example, in the risk screening um, in the field of child protection, as well as to detect, to detect um, I have to say, alleged uh, welfare fraud. So the potentials and benefits of um, AI um, are on, on hand. We, ha we see that AI can make processes in, um, in public uh, services more efficient. They can improve the equality of public service provision while reducing the workload of public officials. And um, better services plus happier employees um, maybe also have a positive impact on administrative legitimacy. So for me, it's, uh, it's puzzling. Why is AI at the moment on a large scale level not yet um, implemented in social services? Next slide, please. This could have something to do with the risks that are associated with, it, with the AI in this relatively sensitive field of application. In some cases, uh, you see it on the slides, AI um, may have led, AI-based decisions, I have to say, may have led to disc uh, discrimination, to wrong decisions, and even uh, to the alleged or groundless allegation of welfare fraud and even child endangerment. And why did that happen? One reason is um, that um, databases can be biased. Another reason could be that public officials are not capable of dealing with AI recommendations. And a third um, reason could be that also time pressure um, leads to the fact that human oversight uh, is not given anymore. So um, on the one hand, we see technical aspects of AI tools may not be the only reason why AI Project, projects fail or have severe consequences for, um, for citizens. Um, but we see, on the other hand, uh, you um, also have, have to uh, have the you have to consider the citizen. Um, you have to consider the um, perceptions and um, preferences of the users of those tools, which are the humans or the um, public officials and public administration. Next slide, please. So what we know already is involving users, public officials, but also um, maybe citizens in the design process and the um, development process of new technologies can raise um, its acceptance, maybe also appreciation and long-term use. But what we don't know is right now what are the preferences of public officials in, in public administration when it comes to AI? Um, I had the pleasure to do research about that together with my colleagues from the University of Bremen and the colleagues from the Institute for Employment Research. And we asked placement officers in public employment services in Germany on AI. We did not ask them directly to uh, reduce effects of social desirability but we hid our questions regarding AI behind a experiment. And here you can see 
uh, preliminary results of that experimental study. We um, described a hypothetical AI tool which identifies um, uh, the um, further training needs of job seekers. And we described this hypothetical tool um, to the placement officers who participated in our study and we changed certain characteristics of that tool and showed uh, different variants. And by that we tried to find out what are the preferences of the placement officers in Germany. Uh, and we see design choices, they do matter. Uh, those 1,400 placement officers uh, we were uh, interviewing, they uh, clearly prefer in-house development uh, versus uh, external or even um, uh, private development or private um, um, developers from, from, a pro from abroad. They also prefer AI tools um, which operate on a broader databases um, and they also uh, are in favor of keeping their uh, decision autonomy. They don't want to give it away. And plus, uh, efficiency plays also a role. The uh, placement officers in Germany prefer um, AI tools which uh, um, yeah, reduce uh, work, the, the workload. Placement officers, by the way, are responsible for counseling and placing job seekers, so they have a really important um, tasks. We also wanted to know uh, if they could imagine working with such a tool in their daily work. And we found out, yes, the majority would appro uh, approve such a system. Uh, but this AI openness um, depends on the type of task. So you have a um, task with a high discretionary power. And if you give uh, these tasks to an AI tool, this could also imply additional risks. Please switch to, to my last slide. So uh, what do we need for a good, like trustworthy, secure, and really good AI implementation in social services? We definitely need uh, to know more about the preferences of the users, which are not only the public officials, but also the citizens. And I'm also convinced that we need to urgently understand how we can use the advantages of generative AI without infringing privacy. Thanks a lot. Marika, I'm not letting you leave the stage yet because we're having the Q&A now. So please come back. That also goes for the two other speakers. Thank you very much, Marika, for your presentation. Please, thank you. As the participants uh, in the panel approach, let me encourage you to keep sending us your questions over Slido. And in the room, I prefer, but the choice is yours, that you don't use Slido, but rather raise your hand to make it a little more dynamic and make sure it is a human in control of the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I have something on Slido already. I'll start with a question from Slido, and then I'll turn to the room. Zoekt en gij zult vinden. Seek and you shall find. That's a Dutch expression. If you look into a specific kind of business, you will find fraud there, which will be added to the data. How do we prevent blind spots? So if you look into a certain place, you're more likely to find fraud. How do we prevent blind spots? Bart, perhaps. Uh, yes, um, challenge because um, we are using uh, databases and the blind spots are already due to the databases because if you are not in a database, that's the most important blind spot you will have. Eh? What is not being declared in a database, yeah, you can't use it than an artificial intelligence or risk analysis system. So this is the, one of the biggest challenges uh, to find, uh, seek and you will find, of course, you can only seek and find what is really going on on the field in combination with what we have in risk analysis tools and in the databases. That's why I showed also the slide with a lot of databases we have 
because not, what's not being declared, you can't find. Um, so the blind spots already, uh, the biggest blind spot is not in the database. And then, of course, within the databases, it's all depending uh, on the quality of your uh, uh, data. Uh, this could be also be a blind spot. If you can't find the, the people or the employers or the citizens and so on, how on earth are you going to prevent or detect or control or the inspect and so on? So you have to have, for me, uh, and we have this in Belgium, you have to have a unique number uh, so you can link between those different databases, your citizens, your employees, your employers. Um, and I think on the ESPOS, um, I think this is also a very good example uh, from the Commission that uh, perhaps uh, if you are linking people who are coming to Belgium or whatever country, uh, you have to have a unique number or, or link those combinations because they are in a database and then you have other databases that should be combined. So this is quality, it's interoperability yeah. and so on. Who is familiar with the ESPAS? Raise your hand, please. The ESPAS project. It's a minority. <laughs> but could you please explain to us oh, yeah. what if, is the uh, if you, briefly if you, write a, a if neutral? You take, if you take a plane, you uh, uh, um, then uh, everybody gets a ticket. Otherwise, you can't enter uh, your plane. And in fact, if you are coming, uh, the ASPOS is in fact labor migration mobility tool. But there are people who it's a social security pass, basically. It's yeah. a social security pass. So and you will have it in a wallet with the code, uh, we as an inspector, we can check it if, with all those databases, if it's okay or not okay. That so means if you move from one European country yeah. to another European country. Hopefully I'm okay, colleagues. Yeah, and right now there's a pilot project going on which relates, which is trying to implement the SPAS. And this could be, of course, of great benefit to mobile EU citizens, mobile EU workers, because the transfer of information and the transfer of rights and the interoperability between the different national social security systems will be facilitated by that one pass. It's basically like, like having a passport that can be checked everywhere. Um, is this approved? <laughs> is my explanation somewhat all right? Or would you like to add something? Good enough? All right, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, let's uh, see if there are questions in the room. Yes, sir. Can we have a microphone on this end of the room? And then uh, we'll go to the gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, Kara van der Poorten, European Commission. Welcome. I'm not a connoisseur um, of AI and databases, but I hear regularly the importance of good data versus bad data and interoperability. It makes sense, but for the non-knowledgeable could you maybe give an example? What is then a bad database? How could we see that? Because it's, it's of course, an, something hard to imagine. For us or for me? Yeah. Who you would can like choose. To you can choose. The question is, what, what, so is, what is an database? example of a bad database? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. I, I, yes, I think I can say something about this because um, we have many databases at IMPS, as I, I said. And we use uh, data from uh, internal and external uh, databases. And uh, we had problems with um, data quality. So a bad database uh, can be a database that, um, where data uh, are, um, uh, are old or mm -hmm. um, are not, not updated. Uh -huh. Sorry? Not when they are not updated. Yeah, yeah they're not updated or uh, sometimes they are um, um, not good because of human errors. For example, sometimes it happens that we can find that um, a company has been founded in 2030, but of course it's not possible. So this must, must be an error of the people who inserted the data and um, Having uh, a big data uh, infrastructure also helps us to, to deal with this because we have data about the same uh, employers, for example, from different databases. So uh, th this enables us to compare the data from different databases and uh, we can clean the data. 
Excellent. Bart, perhaps maybe in addition yes, from you? Uh, in Belgium, we have um, I think as something relatively unique. We have so a, a crossroad bank. Um, so we, his in this organization is interconnecting different databases, and it all begins with the authentic source. So your authentic database should be correct. Uh, and of course, like a colleague says, it starts also on the beginning. In the beginning, you have to have checks and balances for entering in, uh, an element in, in, in your database. So that means primary uh, checks before you introduce something. And it's related also, I think, uh, to a unique uh, key. And we have in Belgium uh, our, uh, uh, our uh, unique number uh, that we are using throughout our, all our databases. So each, uh, each citizen in Belgium has a unique number. And we, uh, we, when we uh, speak in cross-border relationships, perhaps, uh, for instance, not perhaps, with Holland, sorry, uh, they don't have this, and that means sometimes <laughs> it's very challenging to interconnect citizens from there, from, uh, from Holland to Belgium country, even a cross-border relationship uh, when you're working in Belgium or vice versa, to identify them. It's really, really hard because they don't know the, uh, the, the, that number. So, for instance, my name, Bart Stalpart, uh, if everybody can understand my name a little bit. It's in English, bird stable horse, uh, for those who want to know what it means in Dutch. Um, but of course, you can, you can write my name in many different phrases with T, with DT, with double A, or whatever, and that's what my colleague already said. If they, you introduce wrongly in different databases, so in different, so not in the authentic database, mm. with not a unique number, then you will have problems afterwards with your risk analysis and data mining too. Yeah. It's all linked. Huh? Excellent. I'll take a question and then return, and perhaps, Marika, you can have a say then. Uh, the gentleman who is uh, somewhat in the middle, if he could have a microphone, please. Please raise your hand so the mic runner can see you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Lamed Kleiman. I'm also from the European Commission. Welcome. Like quite a few people here in the room, it seems. Um, should I move away from the left? No, no, it's all right. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thanks to all th three speakers. I think uh, these were excellent presentations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very different, but uh, I, um, actually now I have uh, one comment and one question to to all three uh, uh, speakers. The comment is uh, maybe a bit referring to what we just discussed about blind spots and uh, bad databases. I mean, I'm, I've been listening to the discussions about uh, uh, enforcement and data mining for years. Um, my biggest doubt about all these was uh, how fast these uh, models and databases actually adapt. And what I mean is uh, there are constantly new forms of fraud and uh, all the systems run behind that. I mean, that's, uh, that's somehow the destiny of inspectors uh, that uh, as soon as something changes, a new law, but as well some new practices, you basically start from scratch. So that was my comment, uh, but uh, looking at Bart, he will comment on my comment. <laughs> <laughs> and now the question to all, all three, I, I try to make a connection between what we uh, heard yesterday. And, uh, and that's uh, the impact on employment. I think Mareike had already some, some good examples on what staff actually thinks about it. Bart had that as well. Um, so my question there is, uh, what kind of effects has it on the, uh, on the work organizations? Which, uh, which uh, task of a job become obsolete? I understood that Bart had to hire new uh, people for uh, data mining, but uh, some other people, I guess, have, uh, have uh, lost parts of their job. So what, what okay. is then the effect, and uh, again, it's, it's really for all three, um, in terms of work organizations, of number of staff, and uh, 
if possible, as well on job satisfaction. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So how uh, fraud proof can, can this be and what jobs are likely to disappear and how about job satisfaction? Malaika. I can try to answer that question maybe partially. I'm not a practitioner, I'm not an economist, but I've talked a lot to uh, practi practitioners and AI project leaders in social uh, services and um, they have the feeling that uh, Workers, for example, placement officers, uh, those people I described in my presentation, there are people who are afraid that they will lose their job. It's not the case in Germany as well that people um, have uh, limitless contracts uh, in the public employment service. Um, so the fear exists, but at least um, in our survey, we felt also a lot of, um, we had a lo lot of positive feedback from people saying, yeah, we need these tools in order to really concentrate on the difficult, um, I don't want to say cases, but I have uh, not another word. So um, there were also, um, there's also a chance to improve um, uh, jobs through AI in the context of public services. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Lambert, for uh, for your comment and uh, and your question. I think um, yes, uh, that's that's the biggest challenge uh, to uh, to adopt your scenarios on the new phenomena. Um, I'm, I'm relatively happy with that because that means we always have a job. And with that saying, I respond also on your second question because that means your fraud phenomena or changing, adopting, there's new legislation, platform economy, and so on. So you have to be creative, as creative as the fraudsters themselves. And of course, they are, they are using um, uh, AI also. Huh? Uh, the, the other side, if you, can, if you can say it like that, they will use it also. So we have to adopt and try to reinvent ourselves. And I think that's the innovative culture that we should try to introduce also within our own institutions. And what are you referring in, in, the, in, the, in your second in your question then? Of course, it's all related to change. Uh, we started in 2014 and we had those comments. Uh, what, what are you kind of trying to do? We as an inspector that said it, uh, we, we know it better. We know our, our field, we know everything and so on. How do you... What do you think? And you, we, we try to solve this mm -hmm. by combining the, the business, so the inspectorates, their knowledge, together okay. with the data scientists. And those symbios between those two, it really helped because they saw the added value once. And we didn't show it, but everybody knows it a little bit. When you saw it on, on, on a visual side, what the uh, uh, risk analysis or data mining tool or artificial intelligence, then you see as an inspector on the field also the added value because you, you can't see the things because you're only on a single point in a specific area, specific domain. But if you understand, if you understand if we, what we saw in, in Italy, this is incredible. And then they are linking with all these different uh, scenarios. So this is great. And I think an individual inspector can never see this. You, you can use this. The impact for, um, for jobs, um, I think um, uh, we always need inspectors because the blind spots, always. So I don't see it on that uh, relationship. Uh, related to tackling social fraud and uh, my competences. And then what uh, my colleague also said, uh, there will be new jobs uh, that will be uh, created. It's, okay. it's a help. And so it will create new possibilities and uh, so new jobs. Very briefly, uh, Paul, um, Bart, I'm getting a question from Slido that, that is about your comment. Could you give us a concrete example of how the other side is abusing AI. Just one concrete example. What is something that they could do? Yeah, uh, we have a policy that we don't explain, and I will keep my word on it. We don't explain the methodologies of the other side. We promise we will not do it at no, home. No, no, no. Because if we do this, that means they are listening. Huh? They don't think so. They are listening. Huh? Everybody is listening. So they d we don't do this. We, we actually, our methodology, we're not explaining this. This is a base rule with everything. It's also related to how far what, can you explain the black box? I would, because that's a challenge. I understand. Yeah. I will not do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Clear. Don't worry about it. Thanks. Uh, Serena, I'd like to ask you, um, 
what can other European countries learn from the Italian best case? Oh, <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, um, I I think that um, it's quite clear uh, that AI can really help organizations uh, working better and more efficiently. So uh, also trying to respond to um, the, the question, um, it's uh, in the case of uh, our organization, it's going to help us uh, to face uh, the lack of a work workforce. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's um, allowing IMPS to concentrate uh, people to work on really, in the case of anti-fraud, of really risky, risky cases. Um, this means that uh, artificial intelligence is really a boost for, for services. How can it be exported to the EU level? Uh, I think the, the first issue, uh, as um, it's quite clear, uh, and it's also been said yesterday by Professor Pissaridis. Uh, the issue is the data. So, uh, oh. can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the issue. Is, no, I think it's too hot. Uh, issue is the data. So uh, we need data availability, data sharing, interoperability of databases uh, can be uh, must be the basis for. Uh, um, for using AI at the EU, EU level. Also concerning SPAS, uh, I think this uh, could be um, uh, really helpful for citizens, but I think um, a digital passport, of course, needs uh, data sharing to be really effective. Excellent, thank you very much. Let's turn to the room again, see if there are questions and comments. The gentleman in the front. Hello, thank you. Benoit Abelos from the European Commission. It seems we have a lot of questions. So we've talked about the, the importance of having access to data, the quality of the data, but I guess the diversity of the sources of data as well is important. Uh, data from uh, labor law database, social security, maybe tax, um, <coughs> business insolvencies, uh, etc. Did you did you face uh, whether in, in in Belgium or Italy uh, barriers, whether they are regulatory or political, to uh, to interconnect these databases and to be able to uh, to mm. mine uh, uh, such of, uh, diverse uh, uh, sources of data? Marika, perhaps we start with you. Do you have an idea of this? Um, Maybe uh, maybe you start as experts. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can <laughs> so, start. is there resistance indeed to connecting the databases? Yeah. Yeah, of course. As I um, as I said, uh, data uh, sharing and interconnection of databases is fundamental. But uh, yes, we have problems also at the national level to uh, to interconnect databases. But this, uh, the problems this are, are are technical of, of uh, or are they unwillingness? Are they fear? Uh, one, one of the issues, I think, is uh, data protection, uh, which is a um, very um, big problem uh, to deal with. But I think that, um, personally, personally, I think that when we... Um, uh, our goal is uh, to enhance um, services for uh, the citizens and also to combat frauds uh, data protection should be um, taken into account but should not be a barrier and concerning my work especially and uh, what i uh, try to illustrate uh, during my presentation um, our um, dashboard our um, Compliance scoring mm. is about employers, so it's not about people, uh, persons, but it's about businesses. Okay, excellent. Bart, are you witnessing resistance in Belgium? Um, 
It uh, depends the way you are uh, selling it. Um, I, I refer to my, uh, my, our strategic plan for tackling social fraud. So they approved it on the government side. So digitalization, artificial intelligence is in it. But why is in it? Because we can prove the added value of our risk analysis system because we can three times faster detect social fraud. The, the infringement rate is much higher and so on. That's one perspective, tackling social fraud, but I think it's more interesting re also in relationship to this, this session. I think you have to show them the added value of um, the citizens, like my colleague says, the citizens, the employers, the, single, the, the, the advantages by using those techniques uh, and, and not discussing the social fraud issue because this is the result of perhaps combination of different uh, ways of behavior of those uh, employers, employees, or mm. whatever, okay. uh, added value can, sh can be showed in the interest of the, of the uh, public services, but also the citizens and the employers. And I think this is a more effective um, angle um, by showing them the added value on this side. Can you just uh, connect to Serena? Then, then they can explain it to their public on the political side. But of course, uh, if I can may, there are also always legislation uh, burdens also. I uh, exchange information with the police side. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, uh, how can you, and, and then we are privacy law, proportionality, and so on, finality. Ali, there are elements that should be respected. Uh, I, we don't have to know if someone is a murderer or not, to be very blunt. Uh, um, so there are, of course, there are still some barriers, and perhaps they are good, there are still some barriers. With the tax administration, that's always a difficult one, um, and it's not only in our country, if in general. It, it has nothing to do as such with uh, political willingness or not. This is more, yes, historical and so on. Yeah. Right. You actually tackled my follow-up question, so, th so thanks for that. I'll turn to Slido and then back to the room. Um, I have four votes, even though I feel that we already tackled it, but I'm, I'm going to ask again because four votes. What does AI mean for cross-border mobility? Hmm. If you want, sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. I thought everybody is on Slido, but um, yeah, AI has, um, I think from my perspective, different um, um, potential when it comes to enabling labor, labor uh, mobility and uh, I think we have potentials with regard to the workers who move okay. and work abroad. I think uh, AI can help to integrate them faster in different cultures and different um, institutional settings as well. I think uh, perhaps job matching. Mm -hmm. Job matching would be an, would be another tool. And uh, yeah, I think it has a lot of potentials for workers who move abroad and have to adapt uh, in different environments um, in labor markets with different norms and regulations and also maybe different social benefit schemes. All right. Uh, I think every, every, Brief, please, everything yes. is set. Uh, you, if, you, if you explain the people from abroad and they come to Belgium, what are the, what are the rules? What can they expect? Uh, if artificial intelligence can help to translate uh, the, our Dutch language, uh, common Dutch language, in their language by artificial intelligence, they know their rights, they know what they can do, where they have to go. I think in a migration situation, this is great. Speaking of language, it's one of the worries that receiving societies have workers arriving that do not speak the language. This question is extremely forward looking, but do you think that at some point, because AI can produce excellent interpretation tools, that this, bur this barrier, in a sense, for mobile work in the European Union will decrease? Or is it actually undesirable because you want people to speak the language of the place where they live? The, the last one is a political question, I think. Um, uh, and political, and then again, it's also sociocultural. I think it's more for you. Uh, but uh, it's important to speak the language and uh, understand the language, but the techniques can help to, to understand, of course, the other side. As long but as when you're transitioning. Yes, but more important, it has to be authentic. Um, so that means you have public organizations that approve these translations because other, you see the difference. It should be authentic. Right, I see. And the message must be uh, translated by uh, 
a uh, public service uh, because otherwise it's not perhaps correct data or information. Excellent. Going back to the room. Is there more in the room? There's, there's a question. Yes, can we have a microphone go to this corner? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for a maybe more controversial question, but we are talking about fraud outside, but what about those tools versus fraud from the inside? So corruption, does it make more vulnerable or the opposite? Um, what are the control mechanisms to have in place, um, etc.? Because this is, of course, valuable information for somebody who wants to abuse and maybe from the inside as well. Thank you. Well, like, have you uh, any knowledge of this or response to it? Do you mean um, the risks if uh, different databases are connected and the risk of privacy viola yeah. violations? Yeah, corruption will always exist, so also in a digital era. My question is, does it make it easier or more difficult or are there more checks and balances? Because it's also highly technical, so maybe it's once you know it's easier to hide it, that yeah. you're, for example, changing the prompts, that you're changing the, the input, uh, et cetera, from the inside. Huh? So, so we're talking about the employees, for example, the managers, et cetera, within exactly. the social security organization. Just to... Uh, their fraud or their corruption, quote unquote. What does AI do with that? Um, I can I can only um, admit yeah, or um, support that point that the... Um, yeah, transparency, which the, the public sector always has to be transparent yep. um, and should be also transparent what kind of AI tools um, are in, in place, what is planned. I think that is really important in comparison maybe also to the private sector. So transparency is important when implementing an AI in, pub in the public sector, but at the same time it's, uh, it's difficult um, how much information should you should you give to the public? Because of course you you want to avoid uh, more corruption, right? All right, can excellent. I, what do I you add, think? Can I add something yes, uh, about IMPS? Um, even if I uh, work on frauds committed by employers, I of course we have a department uh, dealing with internal frauds. And they also are using uh, some AI tools to, to tackle the frauds. Especially, I know, even if I don't know it very deeply, um, they are starting from um, public, public pr procurement uh, sector. They are applying some AI tools to detect uh, uh, if there are uh, frauds in, in that sector internally. Right. A quick remark from, from Slido, um, having more European players that build trustworthy AI models and data centers in Europe, as well as har hardware to keep it safe, would probably be helpful, also in terms of regulation and compliance. Could we please have the Slido question appear? I meant the Slido question to wrap up the session, so it's a poll. Excellent. We would like to ask you this question again to see if the discussion changed anything in your opinion or attitude. With regards to the use of AI within the social security system in Europe, what will be the effect of AI on the scale from one to four? Very positive, positive, neutral, or simply bad? Let's see if we can have a more representative poll. I'll wait a bit more.
Excellent. I'm sure you're quite curious about the result as in comparison to our first poll. So it seems that the attitude has become more positive as a result of the discussions we have. Significantly <laughs> more positive, in fact. <laughs> I'll share it with you. Those who believed that the effect will be neutral, that stayed roughly the same. Uh, first it was 19, now it is 18. Those who believed the effect was bad, this went down by 3% from 8 to 5. Those who believe it was positive, first it was 68%, now it is 48. And the difference went to very positive, which was in the first poll 4%, and then the second poll 27%. Sometimes they say, what's the use of a conference? Doesn't do anything, doesn't change. Well, it does change your attitude, so let's hope that this will also lead to better policy making. I'll now give each one of you one minute time to share with us your uh, final thoughts on this. And I'll start with Bart. Your one minute, Bart. One minute. Um, I hope, hopefully, there were not artificial intelligent tools behind the survey uh, <laughs> you did, uh, the Slido. For the rest, I think, uh, uh, stay positive. I think uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges. The risks will, will be there. Um, but then again, there are quite a lot of opportunities um, and we see the added value. We try to, to have an approach that is um, in line with legislation and privacy mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. Uh, but then again, take the opportunities because the other side also do, uh, will, will do it. We'll be doing it as well. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I, I can go back uh, to Italy um, with a, um, a great uh, with great news because um, it's uh, it's been very interesting uh, to um, to know that also in Belgium they use um, systems similar to ours and so um, I hope. This will be uh, also an opportunity to um, implement uh, contacts between uh, different institutions mm. of different member states, uh, maybe under the auspices of the European Commissions and the Commission, and so to to really um, exchange uh, best practices and. Um, also, in in the in the view of uh, um, improving services for mobile citizens. Thank you very much, Marika. Yeah, as a researcher, I was talking to a lot of uh, public officials and people who are working in pu public administration, uh, also on the front line of public services, uh, where they meet uh, on a daily basis uh, citizens who are in need, and those public servants, they really need such tools, uh, whether with or without AI, but they need tools to support them in their daily working routines. Uh, they want those tools um, to take over the administrative burden. They need more time for the important tasks to talk to the citizens, to help them uh, who are in need in the, in the field of public um, or social services. So maybe we should uh, or maybe the policymakers should find more ways to, um, uh, to, yeah, to create possibilities to test AI in a secure uh, area without like vi violating um, data protection laws. But I think also that the agencies <laughs> by themselves uh, would like to, to mm -hmm. test it more, but they, they are afraid of um, making something Wrong. Pilot project so like maybe we need more yeah. regul ma regulative playgrounds. Mm. Difficult mm. word. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you online and on site for your participation. I thank the tech team for their support. I thank the commission colleagues who took responsibility for this panel. And I also thank them on my personal behalf for the collaboration. And please also join me in thanking our excellent speakers before you head to your break. And then on time to your next session, Bart, Serena and Marijke. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.